I'm going to try to do is to talk about four moves in God's grace in the Old Testament. Uh, and you can decide as we go along whether you think these are great leaps in God's self understanding or whether you think the context pulled stuff out of God that was there anyway or if you think that it was simply um, human persons coming to greater understanding about the mystery of God. I'm not sure how to parse that. But my first uh, thing that I want to talk about is that the Old Testament participates in what is called the common theology of the Near East. It was everywhere. And in that common theology, uh, it was believed that you get rewarded for obedience and you get punished for disobedience. Scholars call that a structure of deeds and consequences. Certain deeds produce certain consequences. So if you smoke long enough, you'll get lung cancer. If you stay too out, out too late, you won't do well on the test tomorrow. It's, it's not magic. You can figure that out. That theology turns up in many places in the Old Testament. First in the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy is probably the theological center of the Old Testament. And so it is written in many places in Deuteronomy, but in Deuteronomy 30, Moses says, Behold, has God say, Behold, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey, then you will live. But if your heart turns away and you do not listen, I declare to you that you will perish from the land. So you better shape up. That theology that sounds hard to us has the merit of saying that human conduct matters that God takes seriously how we live our lives and that we have choices about our futures. The same theology of deeds and consequences turns up in prophetic speeches of judgment. So regularly the prophets indict Israel in a speech of judgment for having broken the commandments, and then they say, therefore, therefore you'll get uh, pestilence and sword and famine and all those covenant curses that feel like the wrath of God. The, the trick in the prophets is that KG word, therefore. And they never explain how you get from there to there except by therefore. Or the third manifestation of this kind of common theology uh, is found in the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs uh, believes largely that what you choose is what you get. So a slack hand produces poverty. If you're lazy, you'll be poor. That's widely believed among us, well-off people. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. But it's kind of a mystery. Some give freely and grow rich. Others withhold what is due and only suffer want. So you better pay attention about how you, you better be wise. Don't be stupid. So this theology turns up in covenantal speech, in prophetic speech, 
and in wisdom cadences. If you think about it, that's kind of uh, lots of places in the Old Testament. And that common theology is alive and well among us. It has become a tool of reprimand and punishment for those who do not measure up. So the war on the poor that we are conducting in our society is that the poor are the undeserving poor and they get what they got coming to them. Or in our great consumer festival of self-indulgence, Christmas, <laughs> the same theology shows up right out of the book of Deuteronomy. He knows if you've been naughty or nice. He knows if you've been good or bad. He's making a list and he's checking it twice. So be good, for goodness sakes. This theology will yield coal to bad children and excommunication to those who do not produce and hustle in the economy. And the world is held in God's sturdy governance, and you cannot get out of it. That theology allows no slippage, and uh, it is the theology that has led to a Christian character of the Old Testament as a book of legalism and moralism and all kinds of bad stuff. So that's my first point. I hope that won't preach. <laughs> In 587, Jerusalem was destroyed and everybody was traumatized. And I don't know, maybe God was traumatized or the people who bore witness to God was traumatized because when everything was lost, it was no use to hammer people about deeds and consequences. So there is a kind of a leap, Jeremiah 31, it's exilic. The people who survived the sword, that means 587, found grace in the wilderness, that means exile, found grace in the exile, when Israel sought for rest from the weariness of exile, the Lord appeared from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love, and therefore I have continued my faithfulness to you. So what happens in the Old Testament, as so much as we can date the text, is that there is a leap on God's part out beyond deeds and consequences because deeds and consequences were of no use as a theological construct. There is a reach beyond ordinary possibility. There is a reach beyond ordinary theology into a new world in which God says again in Jeremiah again, I will build you and you shall be built, O virgin Israel, again. You shall take up your tambourines and go forth in merrymaking again. You shall plant vineyards. The planters will plant and enjoy the fruit again, again, again. There will be building. There will be dancing. There will be planting. There will be a re-performance of the old divine generosity. So Israel has muffed its first chance with Yahweh. That's what they concluded about the destruction of 587. And it may be that's what we're now to conclude that, given Ferguson and uh, Baltimore and all these places where the world is disintegrating before our very eyes. So what happened in the exilic period, they began to articulate God saying, if you will return, if you will resubmit to obedience, if you will repent, I will love you again. So even the book of Deuteronomy, after all that deeds, consequences, business in its core, has texts around the edges of the book of Deuteronomy 
that invites Israel to repent if you will seek the Lord your God and search him out with all your heart and with all your soul. You will return to the Lord your God and the Lord your God will be merciful to you. A return to obedience issues in the statement that the Lord your God will again take delight in prospering you just as he prospered your ancestors. So Jeremiah, who is a child of Deuteronomy, uses this image uh, from the book of Deuteronomy about marriage that if you leave, it's very patriarchal, if you leave your husband and go marry another man and that doesn't work out, you cannot come back. You cannot return to Yahweh. But then Jeremiah has God say beyond that in chapters 3 and 4, turn, faithless Israel, return, O faithless children, return, O faithless children. If you return, if you return to me, if you remove your abomination in truth and in justice and in righteousness, you will be blessed. Softly and tenderly, Jeremiah is saying, come home, come home. My wife was like, you didn't try to sing at Fuller, did you? (laughs) Or in Ezekiel, Ezekiel, after that strict calculus in chapter 18, has God say, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn and live. Or in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near, let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So now the word pardon has been uttered in the repertoire of Israel, and the reason there is pardon is that my thoughts about pardon are not your thoughts about deeds and consequences, nor are your ways my ways, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts. So you get it in all the great prophets. In Jeremiah, return, and I will heal your faithfulness. In Ezekiel, turn and live. In Isaiah, let him return that I may have mercy. And in the psalm that Brad talked about this morning in Psalm 32, you can get it at a personal level in the Psalter. While I kept silent, my body wasted away. Then I acknowledged my sin. I did not hide my iniquity, and you forgave me. Or in... Psalm 137, that great psalm of thanks that has all these case studies that some were sick and some were in prison and some were lost and some were at sea. And in all four case studies, we cried to the Lord. That's a term of turning. And immediately the Lord heard and saved and brought us to safety. So the second moment in the history of grace in the Old Testament that God exhibits enough grace to welcome home those who are willing to turn back and and to participate in the relationship of coveting, coveting. But then there is a third moment in God's grace that people do not know is in the Old Testament. And that is that in texts that probably are later than that, maybe not later than that, that God is an active agent who does not and will not wait for Israel to repent or return or come home to obedience. 
It's an astonishing moment in which the graciousness of God just blows all of those constrictive categories away. Because God in passion reaches out to undeserving Israel and says, I want you for my very own. I want to be with you. I want you to be with me. So in Hosea 11, surely the, maybe the best text in the Old Testament, I mentioned this last night in our uh, Q&A, the, the text begins by God reviewing the history of God's graciousness. When Israel was a child, I called him out of Egypt, the Exodus, and I taught him how to walk. And uh, the more I called, the more they went from me. But I loved him and I loved him and I loved him. And then that little child became a teenager and evoked all kinds of anger, as teenagers do. And then in verses 5 through 7, God simply says, I don't care if the Assyrians get you. Let the Assyrians have you. Let them punish you. Let them burn you down. Don't call to me. I will not answer you. And then there is one of the strange silences in the Bible that must be a silence in heaven. Have you ever been angry with your best friend or your spouse or a child and right in the middle of your anger, you, you caught yourself? That's what happened to God in this poem. Right in the middle of God's rage, God says, how can I give you up away from him? How can I hand you over? How can I treat you like Sodom? How can I treat you like Gomorrah, and then God is said to have made a new resolve. My heart quakes within me, and my compassion, there's that word, was warm and tender, and I will not execute my fierce anger, legitimate though it may be, and I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. This is no common ancient Near Eastern God. This is the Holy One. This is not the Holy One who is remote in the heavens or in the temple. This is the Holy One who is in your midst. This is the Holy One in your midst enough to notice the fracture, in your midst enough to care, in your midst enough to reach. It is this reach into the wilderness that makes possible the poem of Hosea 2 with which I began uh, first time around. Therefore, I will allure her and I will bring her into the wilderness and I will speak tenderly to her and I will take you for my wife in righteousness and in justice in steadfast love and in mercy and in compassion. So that poem is a huge move on Yahweh's part to be related to Israel in a wholly new way. And we are not told, was this a was this a new growth? Was this a new discovery on Yahweh's part? Was this a situation of crisis that required Yahweh to say something that Yahweh had never said or thought before? Or was this, this Hosea who was wounded by his divorce and learned how to love and imagined that God loved the unworthy, the way he himself had been called to love the unworthy. And Jeremiah, uh, a century later, is a child of Hosea. And after Jeremiah does all of his rant, whenever I teach the book of Jeremiah, working through it, you get to about chapter 23, and students say, do we have to keep doing this? It's too much. But then you know this text in chapter 31. I, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. New covenant, New Testament, 
and all those Jewish claims and all those Christian claims about the newness. But what is to be observed about that incredible divine statement is that there's no anger, there's not even a summons to repent. There is no conditionality, there is no expectation on Israel's part. And as you know, that promise goes on to say, you shall all know me from the least to the greatest, and I will forgive your iniquity, and I will remember your sin no more. Now the word forgiveness has been uttered. So what God shows is that God cherishes the relationship more than all the summons to obedience. It's an extraordinary moment in the life of faith. Forgive and forget, not remember. It is unilateral, it is unconditional, and this is the fullest, deepest disclosure of God's intention and God's capacity so that the wilderness of displacement becomes the arena for gracious recovery and renewal together. How different Jeremiah is, or how different God is in chapter 31 from chapter three and four where the poet says over and over, return, return, and no return. I will make a new covenant with you. And in between three and four and 31, God had said, I know a leopard can't change its spots. I know Israel cannot change its propensity to disobedience. No change on Israel's part. But Yahweh, in the process of the poetry, has changed from the relentless God of common theology to the covenant-making, promise-presiding God of grace. Israel, Yahweh will not despair of Israel because Yahweh has resources for a second chance. No return, no whisper of expectation on God's part. Only I will forgive. And in chapter 33, I will restore the fortunes of Israel and the fortunes of Israel. I will rebuild, rebuild them. I will cleanse them of all their guilt. I will forgive them of all their guilt. And they shall fear and tremble because of all the good and all the prosperity that I provide for them. A second use of the word forgive. So I mentioned Ezekiel 18. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn and live. And if you want to live, you have to turn. But Jack Lapsley has shown that there is a strange movement in the book of Ezekiel. So in chapter 34, where the prophet does an assault on failed kingship in Israel, Yahweh finally comes to an awareness of saying, if you want to think you've done anything right, you have to do it yourself. So Yahweh says, I myself will be your shepherd, your king. I will make them lie down. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the straight. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. I will destroy the fat and the strong, and I will feed them with justice. Ah. Or in 37, a text we all know very well, I, I'm not waiting on you to do this, I will do this, I am going to open your graves, I will bring you out from your graves, I will bring you back and you shall know that I am Yahweh when I open your graves and bring you up. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. I will place you on your own soil and you will know that I am Yahweh. You will know that I am Yahweh when I take unilateral action to restore your life without condition. It takes your breath away. And in chapter 36, I <laughs> will take you from the nations. I will gather you home. I will bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you. 
I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to do that. You didn't ask. You didn't deserve it. You didn't qualify. I'm going to do that. What's so interesting about this text in 36 is at the beginning of the text in verse 22 and at the end of the text in 32, <laughs> only Ezekiel could write this. God says, it is not for your sake that I am about to act. I don't want you to think I'm doing this because I love you. It is for the sake of my reputation. It is to redeem my holy name, which you have profaned. And the only way I can establish my reputation as the God who I am is to make clear that I am a God who forgives and restores and begins again with a huge second effort. Verse 32, it is not for your sake that I will act. Let that be known to you. So we have to be careful not to make grace too romantic. This God is no softy, no cream puff, no good buddy, or as Abraham Heschel said, no nice uncle. This God is filled with intense self-regard. And Israel has diminished Yahweh's reputation among the nations. And now Yahweh will act to self-repair the good holy name. This is not a very attractive portrayal of God's grace. It's not one we usually turn to. But after we get finished with romanticism about the niceness of God toward us and people like us, it may be reassuring to us that God's reach of graciousness is grounded in God's self-regard. So graciousness toward God's creatures has to be linked toward God's holiness so that in Ezekiel 37, God can say, I will make a covenant of shalom. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will bless them and I will multiply them, which is an echo of Genesis 1. And of course, it's the same in Isaiah in the exile. I don't know how this quite got into the text. God says in 54, for a brief moment, boom, that means a, a beat, for a brief moment, I abandon you. Oh, well, yeah, 70 years. <laughs> so I've been thinking, is a, is a beat of God's abandonment like the moment of a digital clock that you can unplug and plug back in so quickly that it doesn't go 12 on you? <laughs> and then in verse 8, in overflowing wrath for a moment... I hid my face. Verse 7, first line. Verse 8, first line. But then the second line of those two verses, with great compassion, there's that word. I will gather you, and then in verse 8, but with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. And what you can notice between the first line of abandonment and the second line of compassion is there's no explanation, there's no pause, there's no comma. It is something that happened in the internal life of Yahweh that is brought to speech by the poet. So what I think these poets are showing us is the vexed, unsettled internal life of God. So the grace is not cheap. Grace is very costly to God, and it requires God to position God's own self at another place to be so odd among the gods of the ancient Near East. 
And if you meditate on that leap of God made in Jeremiah about a new covenant and made in Ezekiel about a new covenant of shalom and made in Isaiah about compassion after a moment, if you meditate on that long enough, you will come to Psalm 103. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse. He will not keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. It's all about compassion. It is all about womb-like mother love. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life in the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love, who satisfies you with good as long as you live. Verse 5, for you, O God, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love. Verse 15, but you, O Lord, are a God gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. The same words that I found the first session we had in Isaiah, they mark this God who will be in relationship no matter what. And so God asks in response to Israel's complaint in Isaiah 49, can a mother forget her nursing child? What do you think? No, she can't forget her because her breast will hurt. Can a mother show no compassion for the child? No, 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 no. Well, even these may forget but I will not forget you. And then the next verse, God says, I have written your name on my sleeve just in case I am tempted to forget you. So there is common theology of deeds and consequences. There is grace offered. There's no grace, no slippage. Well, you know, no slippage. I want all papers in Tuesday at 9 o'clock, no exceptions. <laughs> but if it's a really good student, yeah, I'll take it Wednesday. Just don't tell anybody. <laughs> a little slippage. So then there is gracious welcome home if you repent. And then there is unilateral grace that doesn't call Israel to do anything. Now, if you want to, you can say that's an evolution, but I don't want to say that. And no doubt we, as Christian believers and Christian preachers, we like that last one. But what I want to suggest to you is that they are all there in the Bible. They are all revelatory, and they are all true and useful in certain contexts. So what I think we have to do is to work the whole repertoire and not be reductionist to come down where we'd like to be. I think that this disclosure of God evidences God as having a great deal of vitality and freedom in this relationship to position God's self in many different ways, at many different times, in many different contexts. And I think we abuse the Bible when we try to find the one we like as the truth amidst all these options. So that's my third thing. Woo really quickly. My fourth thing is that as Israel pondered all of these modes of second chance, it began to think more doxologically 
about first chance. And so it began to think about the manifestation of God's grace in unevoked newness. So they figured out that when God called the world into existence, it was an act of grace. So they figured out when God called Abraham and Sarah to go be a blessing in a new land, it was an act of grace. So when God formed Israel in Egypt and said, I know your sufferings and I have come down so that you can be my firstborn son, it was an act of grace. So what they did about this repertoire of God's options for graciousness is that they began to see that the whole history of the world and the whole history of Israel with God, and then we will say the whole history of the church with Jesus, turns out to be a narrative of grace, but it is a complex articulation of grace that does not admit of simplicity because all serious relationships are complex relationships. So my final point, for which I have four minutes and 50 seconds, is that this overwhelming narrative of God's grace empowers and authorizes and summons Israel to an alternative ethic in the world. That is, when you have been a recipient of God's grace, you have the energy and the freedom and the imagination to act differently. So I have been thinking after Reverend Childs about the structure of the book of Isaiah. And you know that the middle portion that we call Second Isaiah is all about this incredible grace to Israel in exile. Uh, We do not often look, in my tradition, we don't look at third Isaiah, much of Isaiah 56 to 66. But these chapters are about how to order the life of Israel after they came back home by the mercy of God. And what you can see in these daring and radical chapters that we don't read enough is that Israel is summoned to restorative justice so so that What I want to argue is that grace is a function of justice and justice is a function of grace. And we have been wrong theologically to try to tear them apart as Ryan and Eber tried to do. So if it is true that we have been gathered home by the restorative grace of God, then how shall we act? In Isaiah 56, the beginning of what is called third Isaiah, starts out by saying, maintain justice. That's what you do if you are a child of God's grace. And they must have said to the putt, what do you mean, maintain justice? And then that's the chapter that goes on to say, welcome the eunuchs, welcome the foreigners, for my house shall be a house of prayer for all people. Recipients of God's grace are massively inclusive of others who are welcomed as neighbors in the presence of God. And I imagine that our capacity for inclusiveness of the other is a manifestation that God's grace has really transformed our life. In chapter 58, uh, the question came up about how shall we worship 
now that we are restored to our homeland. And uh, he chides them for bad worship because what they're doing is they're praying so much. Thank you, Jesus. They are praying so much, but they are not paying fair wages to their work. That's what it says. That's phony worship. Phony worship if you don't do justice. And then he goes on to say, is this not the fast that I chose for you to set prisoners free, to undo the thongs of the oppressed, to welcome into your home the homeless, to provide food and shelter, because if you do it to the least of these, you have done it unto me. And the Hebrew says, because they are your own flesh. True worship of the God of grace is the material well-being of the neighbor. And if you read along in 3rd Isaiah, you will come to Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim good news for prisoners and to proclaim the jubilee year. The spirit that arises from God's grace is a spirit that calls for emancipatory action of an economic kind. And they loved it at Nazareth when Jesus quoted that. They said, he ought to go to seminary. He has such a good voice. And then, as you know, he said, I'm going to do that. And then they tried to lynch him. So the tie-in between God's restorative grace and the action of the restored community for restored justice in the neighborhood, all is of a piece. And so Leviticus and Deuteronomy said in response to this graciousness, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then Leviticus says, you shall love the immigrant. It's very interesting that the Bible pounders never quote that. And they didn't quite say it, but they are on their way to the rabbi who said, you shall love your enemies. The only way that Israel can obey this Torah and the only way that children of the gospel can act in evangelical obedience is to recognize that this incredible grace of God is energizing and empowering and summoning. So God's grace is not the end of our life with God, that we bask in God's grace. But God's grace is the launching pad for a new life in the world that has to do with justice. So we live increasingly in a graceless world and by our life, we bear witness to otherwise. 